We begin with the border standoff that turned violent today. Clashes broke out at an EU border checkpoint when Polish forces used water cannon and tear gas to push back migrants attempting to enter from Belarus. The European Union has approved more sanctions against the Belarusian government to punish it for creating this crisis. The EU accuses Belarus of trafficking potential asylum seekers from the Middle East to the border with Poland. An outburst of violence after days of mounting tension. Polish authorities say they fired water cannon and tear gas after migrants threw stones and attempted to destroy a fence. Hundreds have massed at this closed crossing, just some of the several thousand stranded on the Belarus-Poland border in freezing temperatures. Their frustration expressed with each hurled stone. It is night, night. It is night, night. We we are asleep yes. in forest, in cold, in Hungary. We are waiting to Europa open way. But them not let anyone to help us. If they give us gas and paper, we will give them stone. The Polish reaction gave the Russian foreign minister a chance to lecture the European Union about human rights. The behavior of the Polish side is unacceptable. I think the water cannon, the tear gas and shots over the migrants' heads towards Belarus, all of it reflects a desire to hide their own actions. And they must understand that they are violating all thinkable norms of international and humanitarian law. As the situation escalates, so too does the diplomacy. Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko held a call with German Chancellor Angela Merkel, claiming he doesn't want confrontation. As I told Merkel, the problem is that if we don't save these people, we will both lose. Both Belarus and, to an even bigger extent, the European Union, which doesn't let the refugees through to its territory. That is why we need to urgently make a decision about them. The EU and its allies blame Belarus for sparking a crisis. EU defence ministers met in Brussels with NATO, raising the prospect of a military response. Of course, we are deeply concerned about the way the Lukashenko regime is using vulnerable migrants as a hybrid tactic against other countries. And this is actually putting the life of the migrants at risk. And this is the human cost. At least 11 people have died in recent weeks. The latest, a 19-year-old Syrian man who drowned trying to cross a river into the EU, laid to rest by members of Poland's small Muslim community. They say they fear he won't be the last migrant they have to bury. And for more on this, I'm joined now by our correspondent Terry Schultz. She is following events for us from Brussels. Good evening to you. Terry, we have seen the most violence, the most violent clashes in this border standoff so far today. And um, what has been the reaction from the European Union? Well, Brent, perhaps not surprisingly, the EU and NATO are much less vocal about violations of human rights in their own member countries than they are in others. These pictures must be making EU and NATO officials very uncomfortable. Uh, Poland's actions, of course, uh, are not what anyone would like to see from an, from an EU country. But at the same time, uh, everyone in, in this town, in Brussels, uh, remains unified behind the message that it was Belarus that caused this situation. And never mind that now it's the migrants on the other end of the water cannons, um, the, the blame remains on Minsk. And that's the message they're sticking to so far. I wouldn't doubt and I would even hope that some private messages are being passed to the Polish government asking them to, to uh, be, be judicious in their, in their use of, of strong-arm tactics like that. I mean, for one reason, as you heard Foreign Minister Lavrov, it certainly gives Russians and other adversaries something to talk about. Yeah, you say the blame remains on Minsk, and yet we, we heard that the leader of Belarus, Lukashenko, had a phone call with the German Chancellor Angela Merkel yesterday. Did that conversation, did it raise a few eyebrows in the European Union? 
It did. I, 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 Angela Merkel did tell the other EU leaders that she was going to make this call, so it didn't, didn't come as a surprise. They didn't find it out about it in the headlines. But, for example, um, some Estonian politicians said this was the wrong way to handle this. No EU leader has spoken with Lukashenko since August 2020, since those disputed elections when the EU agreed with the opposition that Lukashenko had stolen the election, that he wasn't a legitimate leader. So no one else has bestowed this legitimacy upon him of giving him a phone call until Chancellor Merkel. So at the moment, I think that people are waiting, waiting to see if any good comes out of this call. But as I said, there are people who think that no one in, on this side of that border should be speaking with Alexander Lukashenko at the moment. Yeah, it is interesting that the German Chancellor spoke with Alexander Lukashenko when this crisis was erupting. The first person that Merkel phoned was the Russian President Vladimir Putin. All of this begs the question tonight, Terry, does the European Union, does it have a clear plan on how to, to bring this crisis to an end? You know, we've spoken about this several times, Brent, and the plan that the EU is putting in place does seem to be having some effect. You know, the first thing that they were they are doing this week is to go directly to capitals and ask them to stop the flights, stop people from getting on the flights to add to people uh, piling up at the borders there. And in fact, we have seen uh, airlines in Iraq, in Syria, in Qatar, the UAE, in Turkey. Many of these hubs are now saying they will no longer allow people to get on flights to Minsk because it's obvious that uh, they're going to come to no good end there. That doesn't solve the problem of the people who are now on the border, the people that we're seeing now in this, you know, tug of war between Belarus and Poland. And it really isn't clear now how this will turn out. These people have to go somewhere before they can be repatriated, if that's going to be how the countries handle it. But at the moment, it's getting very cold and they're in a very, very difficult position. Our correspondent Terry Schultz with the latest tonight from Brussels. Terry, as always, thank you. And I'm joined now by Olga Drindova. She is the editor of the Belarus Analysis. It's good to have you on the program. L let's look at what's happening on the border right now. Is Belarus now at war with the European Union, a gray war that is taking place on its border and the weapons that it's using are refugees? Well, I'm not sure we can call it a war anyway. It's a kind of a method of blackmailing the European Union. And there are at least uh, three uh, aims that Lukashenko might try to reach. Uh, first, uh, he's trying to um, more or less split the European Union, that it doesn't speak with one voice. Um, the second is... Um, well, he might try to get back his international legitimacy that he lost in August last year and uh, obviously also to some kind, um, well, to shift a focus, so to say, from the human rights violations inside of Belarus to some other topics like migration on the, well, migration crisis on the border between Belarus and Poland. Um, these are the aims of him and I uh, I should say that some of them have more or less been reached. I mean, we're, we're now talking about the crisis on the borders. We're talking less about the, the political situation in Belarus. And he also spoke to Merkel on the phone um, by the Belarusian state uh, media. It was presented as kind of acceptance of his legitimacy. But we still see at the same time that the European Union is at least trying to speak up with one voice and uh, help uh, Poland in this situation. So I don't think we should expect that the sectoral sanctions uh, that were introduced uh, a couple of months ago against Belarus, uh, they would be abolished because of this crisis. I think this is more or less the hope in Minsk now. A few days ago, um, Belarus threatened to, to block or to stop all gas flowing across its territory into Western Europe. Um, do you see that threat, that decision, as one that is being supported by Russian President Vladimir, Vladimir Putin? I mean, Lukashenko says that, but would he be saying that if he didn't have the backing of the Kremlin? 
Well, uh, we don't really know uh, where this plan uh, of a migration crisis comes from, it ca whether it comes from Minsk or from Moscow. We just don't have facts for that. But uh, from the other hand, we understand that without an acceptance uh, of Moscow, this would not have been happening right now. So I think even it was not their plan, at least um, there is still some red line that has not been reached uh, by Lukashenko for the um, Russian president. At the same time, I don't really think that it's in interest of Russia to really uh, become part of this military escalation between Belarus and the European Union, since uh, Russia has also some military obligations towards Belarus, and we know that Poland is a member of NATO. So I think it's just observing with interest what, well, how the European Union can react to such a crisis and what happens within the European Union. But I think there is still some red line that maybe has already been reached because we know that Merkel talked to Lukashenko after she talked on the phone uh, with Putin. Yeah, well, the story is fluid. We will see where things develop. Olga Drindova, the editor at the Belarus Analysis, and we appreciate your insights tonight, Olga. Thank you. Thank you.